Okay, so uh, without further ado, Susan. Susa. Susan, Susa. Okay, Susa, do it. Thank you. How is everybody uh, doing this evening? Good. I can, I can feel a sense of community here, which I really like. I was invited down here by Matt, so thank you very much, Matt. Um, on Sunday, I did a presentation called Educated into Stupidity, the story of the amazing paper trick. Now, what the presentation was about is about the systems that we live under and how they influence uh, pretty much everything that we do. So when I was um, presenting on Sunday, I asked a question, and this was the question. What is heavier, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? So no, I'm gonna, I know I just can't help myself. I'm gonna ask you guys, gold, what gold, is it? Feather, gold, 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 so who says it's the feathers? No way. Okay, we've got two people going down there. So this is those of us who said it's equal, right? Those of us who said it's equal. It started, before I tell you the answer, it started me thinking, what is it that would influence our decision? So the first thing that I kind of looked at is people's education. That's a system, that's an institution. Now I work, you're not gonna believe it, but this is absolutely true. I work with an engineering company by the name of Area 51. I know. I actually have my, you know, I don't have my business cards here with me, but I actually do work for a company. I'm the system strategist for a company called Area 51 Machine Design. What we do is, or what they do, because they're engineers, is make things that actually don't exist. They're working on a project, which is a closed loop hydrogen project, that allows us to store wind energy, which is going to be def definitely a game changer, yes, when that comes along, right? So, you know, basically it's a big honor for me to work with that company. The two rules of the company, I know, again, you're not going to believe it, but this is a local Calgarian company, and these are the two rules of the company. Number one. Leave the ego at the door. Number two, if you don't want to come to work today, don't. And I swear that there are the two rules of the company. So we have some pretty progressive companies here, right here in Calgary. So working with Area 51, I met a gentleman who also works with Area 51. His name is Dr. Caswell. He's worked at the university. And he's basically renowned all over the world for his education and his innovative ideas. So I'm working with him, we were just recently down in Halifax, and we were helping engineers to do create a Halifax. I loved it, it was cold, I got to go there. And I uh, went to, went to uh, Dalhousie University, and we were helping uh, the engineers there to um, you know, talk about creativity, and, and I asked her, do you know, General Licentious, I said, uh, anybody heard of Tesla? How many people have heard of Tesla at, in Dalhousie University as an engineer? How many? How many do you think? Zero. Zero! Absolutely zero. So basically, this is what we are creating our education system, right? But let's just go back. Our education system, we learn mathematics, we learn anal analytical reasoning, and how to put uh, critical thinking. So that could be a very good reason why we would say the pound of feathers and the pound of gold would be equal, right? We learn deduction and calculation. And then I looked at the family value, and looked at the social institution, our family, our friends. And I, you know, I remember my parents saying to me, all men are created equal, equal always fair and love war, treat other people how you want to be treated. So I'm thinking that equality thing, that's another one that would kind of influence me to say the pound of feathers, the pound of gold, pretty equal. Let's go then to the monetary system as good as gold, and we know we want to go to exchange money, we're pretty much going to get the same because one pound, I'm from England, so when I want to get my pounds, I have to get 1.6 dollars to get one pound. So we know we have the checks and balances there, so that's another system that would influence 
the result of one pound of feathers, one pound of gold. Then you also look at the legal system, which is supposed to be um, a reputable, transparent um, um, the legal system, just as is blind, as in impartial. So I looked at all those things, and yeah, it's a pretty good reason, pretty, pretty, you know, I'm pretty confident the answer is they're both equal. Well, those of us who say that would be wrong. I know. We would be wrong. So then I said, well, okay, well, if it's not equal, it's got to be the pound of gold, because we all know gold gold's heavier. If you thought that, do you think you'd be right or wrong? You'd be wrong. I know, and you're like, what? So you would actually be wrong if you said a pound of gold is heavier than a pound of feather. If you were the one person who had two fingers in the pie, who said the gold and the feathers, if you said the feathers, you'd be right. Logical, right? Things are not always what they seem. That's what I've learned. And I'll give you the conclusion to that. Feathers, a pound of feathers is 60 ounces. A pound of gold is measured in troy ounces. 12 troy ounces to a pound, 16 ounces of feathers to a pound. So the people who said feathers would be right. So Gary brought me to that conclusion that not everything that we see, that we think is common sense, that is equal and just elementary is not. And that, let's go back again then to those systems. Let's just have, think about the education system. Wow, education system is a great system. Most of us have been in that the system. But when we look back to find out the history of the education system, see that it was basically through Prusa in a military um, institution that they said, okay, we don't want people thinking, we want everybody just to say yes, no, and do what they're told. So that was the history of, especially the American education system. There is a gentleman by the name of John Taylor Gatto. Has anybody heard of him? He's my hero. He's, oh, he's my hero. And if you know anything about him, he, I have his book. And Daryl is the, the Calgary equivalent of this this gentleman, I honestly tell you that. So you listen up, Daryl. But John Taylor Gatto said he's been spent all his time in education. Then he taught. He got all the awards. Then he realized he was screwing the kids up. You know, he said he just kind of realized. He said, "Think about that. You sit in class. If you're good, you get the ticks. You get the, all the good marks. If you basically do what you're told." And you probably heard of uh, what's the experiment that they do with the bells when they the little have uh, locked up. Where else do you hear bells ringing all the time? <laughs> that should be a cute clue, right? So Pavlov's dog and the education system. So when we take a deeper look at the education system, when we see how it's been created in the 1900s, um, well, basically the in the 1800s, people were independent. People lived on farms, people did not go to Walmart because they made the, everything themselves. They repaired all their own machinery, they grew their own crops, and they defended themselves. So basically, totally independent. What happened, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Ooh. Henry Ford, Henry Ford, you can give me the booze, it's okay, as long as it's not me. Henry Ford, J.P. Rockefeller, they spent more on education than the government did. So as we all know, things are not what they seem, why? Program. And plus they needed workers. They needed an industrial age. So they needed to grab everybody from the independent areas and pull them into the cities. So basically that's where we got forced schooling. Now in Massachusetts, when they forced schooling, they had people really saying, no, you're not taking my kids and came up with guns. The literacy rate was 98% and it's never been that high. So basically by force, Pulling the kids out so the adults will have to move to the cities so they don't have to get jobs. So basically, things are not always what they seem. We talk about the legal system. Has anybody been downtown Calgary and seen the women are persons thing downtown? Anybody seen that? Good. So I'm not just making this up. It's not just my imagination. So I went downtown and I remember when I started thinking about law because I've always had this everything is just how it seems. And then when I was seven, things started to change. So, has anybody ever questioned what women are persons are about? What is that? What would you Women's lib. Women's lib. What else? Equal rights for women. 
anything else? Why would why was it not the equal rights for women movement? Was it the women are persons? Does anybody think a woman is not a person in this room? If there if there is by that many drinks, <laughs> <women. laughs> go ahead. It could be a subconscious way to implant in our subconscious that women somehow aren't a person. That's that exactly right. Accept them as a person when they are. Okay, so now, go ahead, I want more is better. Well, that actually refers to historical events. Okay. Okay, do you know which historical event it refers to? Yeah, actually, well, under Canadian law, uh, women were not considered persons. Right, many, many countries, yes. Yeah, so, actually, I think those five... The famous five, five, yes. They were the kind of women who... Absolutely. But they took it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Yes. And then they declare that no women are not persons. Right. And then they appealed to the Privy Council in England, which at the time was the highest court in Canada. And right. They came back with the ruling that the women, yes, are women are persons. Excellent. I like that you've got the whole story. Save me trying to remember it. Good job. Good job. Good job. I love the secrets. Anybody else? Somebody else who had a little. Women got the vote. So this is a, go ahead. I just wanted to add an addendum, addendum to uh, this gentleman's story. Uh -huh. um, from my studies, it was about white women getting the vote. Ah, it was about ah. white women getting the vote. Excellent. Now I have actually never even thought of that. I've written notes. All right. <laughs> there you go. Because basically, all, everything you're saying is absolutely true. But I'll tell you from the legal stance. Go ahead. Well, are you going to talk about Black's Law for the legal? Uh, yes, because I'm going to absolutely tell you about Black's Law because I have a sixth edition of Black's Law Dictionary. So and I was lucky enough to find it in the first house I ever purchased. So obviously it was meant to be that kind of Black's Law Dictionary. But when I looked in the Black's Law Dictionary, it said, um, persons. It is, and does anybody know what a person is in the legal definition of a person? That's a monster. A monster? That's in the first edition. I have the six, so it wasn't in mine. So I, I've heard that, but I, I can't confirm. Pretty much so. A person is a natural person. It's a corporation. It's a city. It's a municipality. So basically, anything coming under that jurisdiction in law is a person. So in a way, kind of women, we just kind of put ourselves under into the bracket of now we're ruled over. So it was very interesting why we have to say persons, because that's the legal definition. So they, I'm speaking very quickly, and I apologize, because I know we pushed the time a little bit. But the history of the legal system was we have land, and we have sea. We have common law. And we have land of um, mar uh, maritime admiralty law. This is basically the merchants who had all the money who would send their ships out and they're trading and they're doing all this good stuff and then the pirates hit them and then all their goods are in the water and then somebody's coming up and making the claim. And that's basically what our law is based upon. It's merchant common commerce law. So then we have common law and we have admiralty, com um, admiralty maritime law that kind of work side by side, and then they started to merge, and now we pretty much don't have common law. Common denominator for common law, if I damage your property, if I hurt you, or if I cause injury to you, basically I broke a common law. Now there is a remedy for that, because I've done something wrong. But, has anybody seen the new uh, distracted driver's uh, law and stuff? So, okay, so you drive along, Police officers right there, you take a cup, a drink, you take a cup, you take a sip of coffee, you're okay. But if you reach for the sandwich <laughs> and take a bite, you're gonna get the ticket. I know, I know, it's, it's amazing. I know these actions are totally different. One is totally distracted and the other one isn't, obviously, right? So this is how the law is. Who got damaged? Who got hurt? Who got injured? Anybody? Nobody. So it's commerce. It's about tax collecting. So that's why everything we do, exactly, everything we do in law now is just basically under commerce. That's a little about the law. Let's talk about the financial system. I know that everybody probably knows the history of money. If you don't, it's basically, people used to barter, and I love bartering, I always see if I can, I barter. 
People looked at Bata, and then they said, you know what? Uh, a couple of people would roll up Friday night trying to get a basket of uh, chicken wings. And the farmers kind of saying, oh, a basket of what? So I already have chickens, and they want the chicken wings with a hot sauce. So basically, then they started using coins, precious metals. Then from there, they would store their precious metals at the goldsmith or the person who had the storehouse, and they would use receipts or promissory notes. When I was a kid, pounds were in promissory notes. So it's just a promise to pay in gold. Right now, nothing is promised in gold. 1933, all Americans were taken, all the gold was confiscated from Americans, and they said, okay, we're going to buy it about 21 an ounce, and they resold it for 35. I mean, like you do, right? Because everything, you know, everything is not what it seems. So, we talk about the social. I'm going to talk about two very quick things socially. Does anybody remember a band called N.W.A.? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were pretty naughty. Come on, put your hand up if you don't think they were naughty. Put your hand up if you think they were naughty. I thought it was I sang along to some, but I couldn't sing along to all of it. They were pretty naughty. But I used to get people coming up to me and saying, in WA, all those people need to be stronger. That's not an art form, blah, 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 blah. And then I thought it to myself, I said, wow, I said, you know, I, I've composed music before. I've had to hire studios. It's kind of expensive to, you know, is anybody here a musician? How much, how expensive do you used to be before GarageBand? Um, was it to rent a studio? I mean, uh, astronomical, right? So I'm thinking these guys from the ghetto somehow rented a recording studio. I remember when you used to go into those recording studios, you had a big navy board or a solid state, and you had the Neumann in the sound booth and all the cables coming out. It's a millions of dollars worth of equipment. So they had the know-how or they loaned money or whatever they were doing to get the money to go record an album, then to go and pay to have it promoted everywhere, and then Magically, they have video, and then it's promoted all around the world. So I started thinking, and as we know, things are not what they're saying. I said, it doesn't ring true to me. So I started looking who was behind promoting NWA. It was actually a Caucasian gentleman who, by the name of Jerry Heller, and he had $250,000, and with Sony, and then $4 million, they put together and promoted NWA, probably one of the most hated rap bands in the world. You know, just for the kids are listening to this. So I'm thinking, well, what's the motivation? Because as we know, it's not always what it seems, right? So I'm saying, it's okay. I'm not approved. I can listen to the jam. The jam was the thing. Has anybody heard Paul Weller in the jam? The working class, the proletariat. I mean, they music rocked. You know what I'm talking about? So that was, those were my heroes, you know? So, you know, they had that language in and all this stuff. So I'm not a, for censorship. But it started me thinking. Now I'm going to ask one more question. Has anybody seen a Walt Disney movie? Okay, I need you to name some. Asia. Which one? Lion King. Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid. Pocahontas. Which one? Pocahontas. Pocahontas. Anything else? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Is that a Disney one? No. I'm pro pro probably is. What's the correlation? There's a common denominator in all those movies you just mentioned. No, yes. All the mothers were dead. Not always the parents, but you were, I mean, think about your favorite Disney. Where's the mother? Orphan. Dead. This is good promoting family values because that is just what we do. So the thing, I took, I have a daughter and I took her to watch um, Finding Nemo. And it only occurred to me when she had, she freaked out, she was crying. I'm like, what's going on? I realized the mother got killed in like, basically the second scene. And I was like, and I was like, I was turning around, oh my god, what do we do? Do you want to keep going here? Do you want to leave? And he realized it was trauma for the kid, right? The kid's getting traumatized, and here's me, mother of the year, just saying, come on, suck it up, it's just a movie. Right? So, so me, mother of the year, I just made her watch the whole thing. But anyway, it did start me thinking, and there was a Harvard study, and it said, trauma in the early life of any child basically inhibits um, interconnected relationships in later life. Now, the fact that you need to go to Harvard to figure that one out is, um, you know, a mystery in itself. But this trauma that the, a lot of the kids are experiencing 
does go to degrade our social fabric. So basically what I, I'm very, said it very quickly, but my point is not everything is as it seems. And what we have to do, we have to dig just a little bit deeper. And anytime you see something and you think that's the, this is the source and this is the result of this and this is the source, ask yourself a couple more whys and keep digging a little bit further because I believe it's up to this generation. We have to start thinking differently. We have to be the transcendent thinkers because really we do because it may not even be us who come up with the idea but you could go home tomorrow and you could be having a conversation with somebody and that person can have a conversation with somebody else and that can spark this I believe personally people say oh the youth of today I think the youth of today are amazing because they're so involved when, we, when I was a kid we were pretty I mean I think we were pretty hopeless we were you know the six that kind of just happened, so we were just, oh, you know, we got everything, you know. So we were kind of, we didn't really know, but this generation, they're taking a stand and they're standing up. So my last thing before I leave you, and again, I want to thank Matt and everyone for inviting me, and just to say, it's not all doom and gloom. Now, as I told you, I'm a bit of a musician and I also shoot video. So I put something together here, and this was for a competition of a better future. And the whole idea is, what could our future be? And this is just from my point of view, from my perspective of what my idea of a better future would look like. So I'm going to leave you with this.
the expansion of profit, the evolution will not be authorized. There will be no formal application to exercise your rights and your freedom. The evolution will not be compartmentalized. There will be no pulling of strings, manipulation of mind, or blinding with science. The evolution will not be Industrial complex enforcing subservitude. Evolution will not be marginalized. There will be no systematic redistribution of wealth to the high echelons of society. The evolution will not be compromised. The inalienable rights of all living things to sustain themselves in a symbiotic relationship. The evolution is here. The evolution is now, the evolution